first of all, congratulations, Bloomberg Markets Magazine. Here it is, Victor, as the professor gets settled. Uh, you didn't make the cover. <laughs> Minister Lagarde made the cover, and there's a banker on the cover, James Diamond, as well. But congratulations for Thank being you very much. in there. The Thank influence you. of Martin Thank Feldstein, you. many other names, uh, is well. How has fiscal economics changed between now and when you began your career? Uh, when I began my career, which was a number of years ago, we thought that fiscal policy was the way to recover. Um, then we discovered that the timing wasn't good enough. Business cycles were short. They lasted 10 months from peak to trough. So we correctly said, put fiscal policy aside, right. focus on getting the long-term incentives right. Now we're in a downturn that's been going on for three and a half years. Which you called, I might point out, continue. <laughs> and uh, the pendulum has swung back and people are saying, can we design good fiscal policy that will actually help us. I want to get to that in a second. Thank you so much for coming in today. Let's bring this quote up from Bloomberg Markets Magazine, the 50 most influential. Feldstein's stance on balancing the budget got him on the cover of Time Magazine in 1984, although the words monster deficit took up more <laughs> space than his picture. So now look at this photo. Bring There he is. He's, look at you. You're part of the social network up at Harvard. <laughs> Did you, you didn't fall into the river there. I, I did not. not. I was very careful. The president's speech last night, I was thunderstruck by 50-some paragraphs, and paragraph 24, I believe, said we're going to do stimulus, but time out, we're going to pay for it with the, uh, with the super committee effort. Have you ever observed a stimulus announcement with an immediate pay down? Well, there is no immediate pay down. It's not clear how it's going to be paid for. The thing that struck me was, here was $450 billion of spending with no real plan for when and how it was going to be financed. Bloomberg, something I saw, said in the last couple of days that his plan was to raise taxes on high-income individuals to pay for it and to close, quote, business corporate loopholes. Well, that would really undermine whatever confidence building he thought he was going to achieve with this plan. He went after the oil companies within the speech and a few other people that were politically convenient to do. But when you, when you look at our modern fiscal policy, what is the set of options Alan Kruger has to advise the president on? Uh, I don't think there is much that can be done in the short run. I don't think it can be old-fashioned, Keynesian, you give people some money and hope they go out and spend it. People are too nervous, they're paying down debt, they're not going to go out and spend it. So this $450 billion is going to buy us, I think, less than $450 billion of GDP, probably <clears throat> half that amount. So it's a very inefficient program. What could uh, Alan Kruger advise? He could advise that until we fix the housing program, something you and I have talked about on this program many times, until that gets fixed, it's hard to see how consumers right. are going to have confidence, net worth, and a willingness to spend. And we've got Oliver Chain coming up, one of the nation's experts on housing as well. So this is a wonderful show. Dreaded first chart. This is, a, you know, we've got to be light on a Friday here. First fiscal response. Okay, there it is. It's the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. There's the balance sheet of the Fed. The Fed has less and less options. Um, I, I'm honored to ask you this. You would be one of the world's experts. Operation Twist? Operation it, likelihood twist. of success? Not much. It, in fact, it could backfire. You know, if the yield curve is flattened even more, and it's very flat now, why are banks going to be willing to lend? If the cost of funds is not very different than what they can get on a loan, are they really going to be willing mm -hmm. to lend? And how are banks going to rebuild their balance sheet? So the administration is attacking the banks for not having enough capital and going after them for their mortgage sins, penalizing them, taking, taking away money from them. Uh, and yet, unlike past situations where banks were weak, there's no attempt to let them rebuild by giving them a steep okay. yield curve. Is this a failure of policy? And if it is a failure of politics and policy, what is on the to-do list for politicians Monday morning? 
Well, I think they keep telling us that everything's going to be all right, and nobody believes it. And so that's bound to undermine confidence in the currency. To keep being told that Greece isn't going to default when two-year Greek interest rates are about 50 percent doesn't pass the, the laugh test. So I think they have to start recognizing that Greece has to be allowed to default, has would you, to restructure. Would you, you reaffirm what you wrote about and led on, I think of Jakob Fels going the other way, but this idea of they should come out of the euro with an option to come in after drachma adjustment? I think that's more extreme than just um, uh, defaulting, but I think they would be well served and the euro as a whole would be well served if they could go out and if they get their act together then the reward would be to come back in. I saw briefly yesterday uh, Steve Hankey of John Hopkins University, an expert on hyperinflation with a focus on Zimbabwe. Are these interest rates nothing more than a proxy for currency depreciation and dramatic currency devaluation? Well, the interest rates are also a reflection of what's happening to people's confidence in those currencies mm -hmm. uh, in terms of inflation and not just in terms of devalue, potential devaluation. I want to bring this chart up quickly. Martin Feldstein and I talked about this years ago at the White House dinner. There it is, the Japan nominal GDP, how not to grow. And lots of talk, Professor, now, including Professor Rogoff, about inducing inflation into the system. Many people writing on this. Please bring up the quote from uh, the Booth School's Raghun Rajan former economic counselor to the IMF. Uh, they're going to bring it up here. Uh, there it is. Thank you. Is inflation the answer? The reason the control room is a little slow, folks, is Rebecca Minkoff is coming on, and most of the control room is looking for a Minkoff bag. Okay. Is inflation the answer? Central banks would have to regain anti-inflation credibility soon after subjecting investors to a punishing inflation. Investors would have to be far more trusting than now. It is about the market speaking, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think the idea of uh, the Fed shifting from saying our goal is price stability to saying, well, we're going to have inflation for a few years in order to punish you so that your real yield becomes even more negative. That is not a way to win friends for the Fed, to win confidence in monetary policy. I think people will figure they don't know what they're doing. What is the first thing a president should do, granted President Obama now, or a new Republican president, what's the first to-do list to bring down unemployment, or for that matter, just to address this U.S. economy? Uh, it's not a single thing, but let me just repeat what I said a few minutes ago. Housing is very high on the list. We don't fix the housing problem with roughly 20, 25 percent of homes under water, um, five million homes in default or foreclosure. We don't fix that. We're not going to get the consumer coming back to spend. Uh, business confidence. That's really a question of attitude as much as specific policy. If you keep saying we're going to raise your taxes and close mm -hmm. your loopholes, you just undermine business confidence. More specifically, lowering corporate tax rates. Uh, uh, changing our tax treatment of overseas right. profits, those are the kind of things that would help.